one of the challenges with including more plants in the diet is generally a lot of plant foods are higher in carbohydrates. And in today's world in the West, there is a great majority of people that are metabolically unhealthy. I think the number is up to like 93%. Yeah. Disturbingly high. Yeah. For people that are in that boat or somewhere along the continuum of heading that way to being metabolically unhealthy, insulin resistance, pre-diabetic, whatever you want to call it, I could see how including more carbs, spiking blood glucose, spiking insulin, and continuing to push people down that path towards metabolic dysfunction could be problematic. So I'm just curious your thoughts, looking at including more plants, which is going to lead to more carbs from that lens. Yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. Um, there's nuance to this topic. And so it's not so simple. And I think that the, the challenge is that there are many people. Um, this is not just you. This is not just the listeners at home. This is also many nutritional scientists who like to focus on macronutrients, carbs, protein, and fat. Um, but the truth of how our body responds to our diet is far more complicated than those specific cylinders of nutrients. And there are good versions and bad versions of each. And I think that we would all agree there's good fats and there's bad fats. And if I were to sit here and say that fat is bad, I would be a bad nutritionist or I would be a bad doctor. And if I were to say that protein is inherently bad, again, the same would be true. Nor would I say that carbs are inherently good. So allow me to make a distinction because there's good carbs and bad carbs. And the good carbs are fiber and resistant starches. Those are carbs. And they're not so quite easily spiking our blood sugar. In fact, they're quite the opposite. And if we look at metabolic health, those particular carbs actually are the dominant drivers towards metabolic health, right? And I would actually classify that they are more powerful than fat or the absence of carbs in terms of how um, much they can do to improve metabolic health. But refined carbohydrates are a different story. And specifically sugar, but I think that it's also fair to hold flour accountable. And there is no doubt that when we consume foods that involve that include a lot of refined sugar and flour, we're going to spike our blood sugar. And you can add fiber to the formulation. And again, like there are ultra processed foods where they are doing this. And I still would not advocate for that food. It might even have five grams of fiber. I still would not advocate for that food because it's an ultra processed food that's filled up with these refined carbohydrates. When we eat real food, real food, we don't, you know, just to take this sort of complex nuanced topic and try to distill it down to something that's much more simple. Real food contains a combination of carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. Yes, plant-based foods definitely have more carbohydrates. If you have insulin resistance, you can avoid, if you have type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you can lower your blood sugar by avoiding carbs in general. But are you actually reversing the metabolic problem? Or are you just lowering your blood sugar by avoiding the carbs? To me, it's a bit similar to if I hurt my knee, if I lay on the couch, I don't feel pain in my knee. But ultimately, I have to heal the knee. And I would prefer to heal the knee and get back to a functional state where I can run and jump and play basketball and do the things that I love. And when it comes to our nutrition, I would rather help the people heal their metabolic disease so that they can consume healthy food and not have to worry that whether well, blood sugar is going to do this or do that. Again, not to say that there should be no concern about our blood sugar. It's more so to say, let's heal the root of the issue. Let's make the engine run the way it's supposed to. 
So, and I think that fiber and resist, resistant starch are an important part of that. Even in high glycemic foods, Jesse, like berries, people who consume more berries actually reduce their likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. And the reason why is because even though there's some natural sugar in there, you have the fiber and you have the polyphenols, which have beneficial effects. So, um, let me, let me say this just to be totally clear. I do think that you can be completely healthy on a low carb ketogenic diet has to be properly formulated. I also think you can be completely healthy on a high carb plant-based diet, high carb, not meaning 70%. High carb meaning 55% because that's kind of what exists in nature when we eat real food. So I'm here to advocate for people eating real food and finding what works. You touched on the fact that when we're having certain fiber, resistant starch, polyphenols, that the gut microbiome is going to take those. And it sounded like, and here's where I want you to come in, form certain chemicals that are going to help us regain metabolic health. So what's the physiology there? Let's talk about what's getting fed, what's getting produced, and how that contributes to metabolic health. All right. Well, let's start with something very basic and I think quite um, timely right now with everything happening in health and wellness, which is our body's natural satiety mechanisms, our, our body's natural hunger mechanisms. Um, when we existed in nature for millions of years, there was no way to hack that. You lived in uh, famine and you got hungry and that hunger motivated you to find a source of energy for your body. And you, and you ate until you satiated yourself and then you stopped. The problem that we now have is that we have workarounds that create hunger confusion. Um, I would challenge people, and I'd be curious, Jesse, I would I want to hear from you. Have you ever like had a moment where you were you found yourself eating and you didn't even understand why? You're just eating. I'm sure I I'm sure I've at least, you know, been enjoying something, feel full, and because of the you know, flavor and crunch and whatnot, continue eating it beyond what I need. Yeah, so they've actually shown that with ultra processed foods, it actually creates hunger confusion. You don't know whether you're hungry or you're not hungry. Yeah, like chips and, and ice cream come to mind, things like that. Yeah, and you're and you're and you're, and you're not you don't naturally have like there's not necessarily that burning in your stomach to say I need food. You're just like oh I'm just eating this, and I don't even know why I'm eating this. I'm not even hungry, but I'm eating it anyway. And they, and we do know that the ultra processed foods result in overeating. All right, let's get back to the basics here. So the question was about metabolic health. The hottest thing in metabolic health right now are the GLP-1 agonists, um, like Ozempic, Wagovi. There's a place where these drugs are important and helpful to some people who really need them. Don't get me wrong. But what are we doing from a cultural perspective when we don't have any form of dietary or lifestyle intervention on any level. We allow our food system to dominate us, creating addictive foods that make us confused about whether we're hungry or not hungry, that result in us overeating, resulting in metabolic problems because of the calorie excess that we consume. And then we solve that issue with a drug that basically bypasses are normal hormonal mechanisms for satiety and instead is designed to make us feel perpetually full. That's what we're doing right now. If we got back to a simpler approach of eating real food through our gut microbiome, fiber results in the production of short chain fatty acids. Short chain fatty acids stimulate the cells lining the intestines to release the incretin hormones, including GLP-1 and peptide YY. Those hormones naturally exist and we're just not eating food that basically activates them. Now, when it comes to other aspects of metabolic health, the metabolism to me is like this, how do you describe the metabolism? It's a little tricky. It's the engine of the car. 
all right? Energy goes in and that energy gets transformed into something else. In a car, gasoline becomes movement. So, and we want an efficient engine that's running clean. And in order to do that, we really need our gut microbiome to support us. And this has um, become clear through a number of different studies that include some of the work that I've done and also things like fecal transplant studies where they, for example, Jesse took a group of young men and gave them, these young men, by the way, had insulin resistance, metabolic disease, and they gave these young men a new microbiome. And for a period of weeks, those men experienced improvement in their blood sugar, even though they did not change their diet based upon the fecal transplant. The problem was that they didn't change their diet. So that microbiome that they received only lasted a few weeks and ultimately got replaced by their original microbiome because they maintained the same diet and lifestyle. They didn't make any changes. So I can tell you that in the work that we've done at Zoe, I mentioned earlier that Zoe is the science and nutrition company that I'm the U S medical director. Um, I can tell you that in the work that we've done at Zoe, we have research where we look at what is the dominant predictor of your blood sugar. And in the top five is the microbiome. What is the dominant predictor of your blood fat? Once again, microbiome is there. What is the dominant predictor of insulin re release after a meal? Microbiome is right at the top. Like I think number two. So all of these things, our metabolic health, ultimately are connected back to our microbiome. And one of the keys to maintaining a healthy uh, metabolism includes energy balance, which we get from satiety hormones like GLP-1 and peptide YY, and blood sugar and blood fat balance, which is facilitated in part by our gut microbiome and the release of short-chain fatty acids. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. I'm just going to say, this has been a game changer for me. I always get my morning sunlight by nine o'clock. Through that light exposure, you are producing serotonin in the gut, which helps to stimulate your gut motility, which is a healthy gut, is going to ultimately shape your gut microbiome.